Eleanor Williams' claims that she'd been trafficked by an Asian grooming gang led to protests, racist attacks and claims of a cover-up. Eventually, she was jailed for lying. I don't want to be that girl that cries rape. I'm not that person. I'm Sky News' Jason Farrell, and in Unreliable Witness, we ask, why did she lie? And explore unanswered questions with new revelations. Follow Unreliable Witness wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, you ready? You yeah. Ready? yeah. Okay. Good job. Okay, hello and welcome back. This is Electoral Dysfunction with me, Beth Rigby. Me, Jess Phillips. And me, Ruth Davidson. MPs have started their Easter break, but we are powering on. And we're going to bring you a dose of Electoral Dysfunction, you lucky people. We are going to talk today about the royals, China and cyber threats in this massive election year and also talk about some of the questions you sent in about the government's Rwanda plan. Now, you can WhatsApp voice note us on 07934 and the email is electoraldysfunction at sky.uk. So, look, let's get straight to it. I wanted to kick off this week about the royals having a challenge in time. They've had the cancer diagnosis for King Charles and now Kate. I want to talk a bit about the intersection between politics and the royals in a minute. But actually, this story, I thought the way in which Kate announced what was happening to her uh, was really poignant for anyone who's living with cancer, who's lost someone to cancer or supporting someone with cancer. It was a great leveller moment, I think. What did you make of it, Jess? I mean, I mean, on a human level, what felt jarring about it was that she was forced to do it. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think if they had their time again, I think they might have led from the front a little bit more because there's nothing in the nation, I don't think, but sympathy. And understanding... The trouble is she's got two small children. No, three small children, mm. in mm. fact. Uh, and... She would have had to get them used to it. So I get that the time and everything, but it did feel a little bit like she'd been forced Mm. to share it because it's been awful. Mm. I mean, I've lost good people who I think are intelligent to Kate conspiracies in the last Mm. few Mm. weeks. I mean, people who have got doctorates have been coming up with, like, the wildest... Mm. And they think that I know because I'm in Parliament. They'll be like, right, I've got it now. And they'll send me what can only be described as something akin to the fact that they're lizard people. Uh, And, like, really, really sensible people have said some crazy things over the past few weeks around the royals and the sort of secrecy. And I think that maybe this should be a bit of a learning for them that openness is the thing Mm. that makes the British people's hearts open. Mm. And actually the response was, as you said, a sort of a a nation overwhelmed with sympathy and support for her, right? Oh, of course. Well, Um, she's I mean, she's my age. She's 42 years old. She's got young children. In that situation, she is no longer the crown on her head. She is no longer the fancy event she has to go to. She's just a mum. She's just a mum with some kids and everybody goes, God, those poor kids, like, how are they going to cope with it at school? Like, everybody just feels nothing but sympathy for her. And I want to come back to this in a minute because I think also it opens up a way about people having conversations about cancer in a way that touches all of our lives. And I've definitely, my life has been massively affected by relatives in my family uh, losing their lives to cancer. It matters in a way in our social fabric, doesn't it, in the conversations we might have as a, a nation or what it sparks off. But what about where politics and the royals meet. Ruth, is there a crossover in in politics? And does this kind of national conversation around what's happening with Princess Kate, does it have any knock-on on politics at all? I mean, I felt on a human level, like Jess said, I really felt for her sitting on that bench, mm. saying those words, being forced to say it. And you saw, you know, you know the way that she was kind of moving her hands and stuff like that. She was she was not particularly comfortable doing it at all. I actually felt quite angry that she was being forced to do it. And I felt pretty angry about all the people that were treating 
their marriage as a sport, that we're treating her going in for uh, an operation saying, like, I'm not going to be seen for three months as a sport and having Mm. all of these, you know, conspiracy theory, almost parties online about it, bringing in all sorts of wild accusations. I felt sorry for him as well, you know, so he's trying to deal with his dad's got cancer, his wife's got cancer Mm. that they didn't know about. She was going in for something completely different, came out with a cancer diagnosis. He's got three kids, his brother's estranged, his uncle's, you know, no longer able to be seen in the public eye again. And he's trying to hold an institution together with bare hands. And then they're being forced to say stuff that they don't want to. So, yeah, Mm. so I I felt for her and I felt, you know, as as a mum of young kids, that whole, that, that just that chasm that opens up, this idea that, your mind races and you might not be able to be there when they graduate or get married or get engaged or have kids of their own or especially Mm. those kids who have so much scrutiny and those parents will be so trying to protect them because William is the only person that knows exactly Mm. the sort of scrutiny those children are going to be under and Mm. it's exactly the stuff that we're doing oh isn't Louis a funny cheeky boy who's like a little bit naughty yeah that's great and then when he turns like 13, 14 this country's going to do to him, exactly what we did to Harry, exactly what we did to everybody else. And I feel, you know, I just feel like human tragedy. Can we all just stop treating it like a sport? But also, I'm sorry, I'm just going to channel my Republican father uh, for a moment and say, yeah, I I don't disagree with you in the the human tragedy and all that. Like the Queen, I think one of the things that she famously said is that we have to be seen to be believed. And there is an element where they they aren't ever going to be afforded the privacy that maybe my family get and deserve. They're going to be treated a lot better in their cancer diagnosis than my family. And my sister-in-law is currently dying of cancer uh, and has small children just like Catherine. And I, I have to say that there is an element where I think that they have to be open with us, that, that they are public figureheads by duty of birth, I mean, admittedly not in her case, she married into it. I genuinely think that they played it a bit wrong in that I don't think that the level of sympathy would have been affected, but the sport came about in the vacuum Mm. and they sort of owe the British public by virtue of their very existence. They owe the British public something. I get that there's a contract. I do. I completely understand that there is a give and take in this and there's a contract with people. I do just think there are some things that kind of go beyond that contract. And I think that trying to tell, you know, three kids under the age of 12 or whatever they are, that mummy's got cancer Mm. and what that means actually does go beyond the contract. I mean, he's still doing public events. The Queen Camilla is stepping up doing half of Charles's stuff right now. The pair of them are working their backsides off to make sure that the institution of the royal family is being seen in public. I, I do just think that that sort of transcends the contract and that we all... Don't get me wrong, you know, I I saw as much of the conspiracy theories as anyone. Um, <laughs> some of it, you know, was amusing as well as, you know, deep, dark depth of lizard people stuff. But, I mean, I just, it's just, yeah, there's something about it. I, I don't know. I don't get sanctimonious about much, but, like, <laughs> she's a young mum. She's got cancer. Her kids are, like, young. And it's hard to explain that to people. It's hard for people to understand that. I lost my brother when he was in his early 40s to cancer and he had very, very small children, right? So I think this story, as you were saying about your sister-in-law, on so many levels, it touches people because it reignites or re-remembers something for them in their, their lives, right? So it it becomes, even though they're the royal family and they're detached, it becomes quite a personal thing because people, maybe they transpose their feelings onto onto her story, Let's go back to sort of royals and soft power and the way in which politics does or doesn't intersect with the royal family. I mean, Jess, you've done quite a lot of work with Queen Camilla. How much influence does she have? How does it work in royal world when royal meets politics? Well, I mean, there's still a huge amount of protocol that you have to sort of go through so it's not like you're having sort of backroom chats and plotting with members of the royal family the royals don't ever try and influence us as politicians they would never dream of such a thing but the way that they do it they have sort of the soft power and access and convening power that if they care about something and queen camilla she has cared for a long, long time before, uh, certainly before I was elected or before 
it the public knew about she has been involved with domestic violence campaigning uh, and she has some personal experience of a friend of hers from you know a sort of before life of hers that means that she's basically like an old 1970s feminist basically <laughs> and is really really good at convening the kind of people I wouldn't be able to get in a room on issues of violence against women and has been brilliant. She's a proper hoot as well. Yeah, I've heard that. I've never met her personally, but oh, apparently she's, she's really good fun. She's absolute bounce. So we, uh, the first time I ever met her, actually, she was giving she was giving me an award for some community work that I'd done long before I was elected. And my son was with me, my oldest son, and he was about eight at the time. And um, he, we were in Clarence House and he picked up like something and it said like from the Sultan of Brunei underneath, like gifted to the UK from the Sultan of Brunei. And he turned to me and he said, they don't buy anything. Uh, and um, <laughs> it's like, oh, look, they don't buy anything. And she turned to him and she said, oh, we don't. And if you go outside, if you have a look in the garden, in the bushes is some of the stuff we don't like as much. <laughs> hidden it in the bushes. <laughs> And it was like, is it that you don't like the states that they come from or is it that you didn't like the, the pieces? She's too diplomatic to join in with that sort of banter with me. She wouldn't say which was her least favourite country, although I did try and make her. <laughs> but Ruth, because the, the, the royals are not meant to get political, are they? There's a kind of separation between politics and the royal family. There was that famous moment, wasn't there, that you will recall well, I imagine, where the Queen, did she appear to get a bit political about the Scottish independence referendum of 2014? Yeah, there was a very famous uh, case where it was reported that an unnamed onlooker that was greeting her outside Crathy Kirk a few days before the independence referendum had joked to her about independence or something like that. And she, uh, she had replied that she would encourage people to think very carefully about the future before they're voting. Now, that actually doesn't mean anything. One, we don't know if it's true. And the, the palace did put out a statement afterwards basically saying we don't comment on anything. But think very carefully about the future. Like she wasn't telling people how to vote, nor would she. She's, you know, she's a pretty canny operator was the Queen. I mean, how long did she last without ever really creating a diplomatic incident? It must be hard for her if you, like, presumably she you know, has a home in Scotland. It's really important to her. She is the Queen of the United Kingdom. The idea that, that Scotland would break away. I mean, she, she would have hated it, wouldn't she? Of course And then she you would. have to sit on the throne and not say anything. I don't think you'd be able to do that, I, just Phillips. I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to manage the level of diplomacy yeah. that it takes to just be the lowest rung of civil servant. <laughs> the only worry about the interaction of politics and uh, the monarchy, I, I don't think that the, the British public have that much to worry about because there is very little. There is very little influence one way or the other. Like, we don't influence the royals. They don't particularly influence us. But you do start getting into stickier issues when you're in an election year and the monarch is unwell. You know, I think it is fair enough that what we will probably see, unless it is more clearly laid out in the next six months, is the level of speculation about the insecurity that that could cause. Because I remember I was with some government lawyers just before the Queen died because I was on the security bill and we had to be briefed by lawyers all the time during the process of you know deciding on what we allow our security services to do. And I asked the question about what would happen in the transition between... Boris Johnson and Liz Truss if the Queen died. There is questions to ask. When politics is a bit febrile and the royals are having a bit of a wobble, th those questions will get asked. And so we, you know, both politics and the royals are going to have to come up with some robust answers. But, but I think the strength is the fact that they are so apolitical and the fact that the politicians and the royals know exactly what the role is. And I don't think the public would stand really for the royal family getting overtly political beyond the convening power or shining a light on a favoured charity, etc. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it is so much preferred in terms of public attitude surveys. It is preferred to what the opposite could be, which is a, an elected president that has, you know, town hall opening powers, but not much else, but has to sign off legislation and, and could technically sign it. I mean, uh, you know, the, the power that the monarchy holds in political and constitutional terms is actually quite large compared to other sort of monarchies around Europe. 
But it is never, and the, the deal is, it is never, ever enacted. They don't ever wield that power, and that's the deal. Just um, on their kind of neutrality on political life, they do have an important role in our cultural life, right? You could argue, and you can see this in the kind of way in which there are moments in the royal calendar, be that weddings or a birth, marriage, the, the Queen's death where this ceremonial Britain kicks in and this kind of there's a sort of national moment in which millions of people tune into these things. On social leadership, we've had an email from a listener about the royals and cancer care. This is from Sophie. She says, while I, of course, have every sympathy with the Princess of Wales and King Charles, I wonder now if it is an appropriate time to start a discussion about the reality of cancer treatment for the majority of people in the UK. I mean, you touched on that, didn't you, Jess? That yeah, look, I, I mean, I think that rightly they shouldn't make political statements and they shouldn't, um, you know, pick sides on things that are binary. But there is absolutely an opportunity. And they do, they do a lot for cancer charities, no doubt about it. And those cancer charities go on to lobby about cancer care. I think it's going to, that they will tip into the potentially crass um, praising the care that they have had, which they have no choice but to do. And Catherine already did that in her statement and the, the king has done it himself. But I, I think without even some nod of recognition to the fact that it's not as easy for others, I think has potential to cause them trouble. Yeah, but it, yeah, the thing is, it's difficult as well, isn't it? Because if they say anything about cancer treatment, apart from benign statements about thanking the staff mm -hmm. and the medical teams that are helping her. They're in hot water. And the reason is because this is a very political issue. Just quickly, okay. NHS England guidelines aim for 75% of patients with suspected cancer to receive a diagnosis within four weeks of a referral. 85% should wait less than two months for first treatment. The last time those targets were met was back in 2015. Not everybody has the vigilance on them post a diagnosis and I'm not saying for a second that the royal family shouldn't and that no, everybody in the country knows that they will have more vigilance I am saying I think that there is an opportunity to you know whilst and I think this is probably unprecedented that two members of the royal family had a disease at the same time so openly and being so open about it and good on them for that but I think that you know, if they don't address that particular issue, I just think that it's dangerous. And people like me who feel sympathy for them start to feel a little bit like hurt by it. I guess what the royal family can do, though, is raise awareness around health issues. Because, you know, for King Charles, having said that he had a prostate issue, that then prompted lots of gents to go and get checked. And, and you know, we don't know what type of cancer Catherine has. But again, it's one of those areas where you know, if anything is ever wrong with you, just go and get it checked. If something doesn't feel right, go uh, and get it checked. Absolutely. Don't don't be a hero. Just get it checked. It's much better to yeah. find out there's nothing wrong with you. You're not wasting you, anybody's time. And if you get checked early, you've got so much better uh, chance of survival. Look, let's move on. Let's get back to straight politics. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, would you say, Ruth, that he is on top after calling out China-backed cyber attacks and announcing sanctions on China? Well, I think he's kind of latterly got to the right place. But actually, if I was to pick somebody on this issue that was on top, I'd probably pick somebody like Ian Duncan Smith or Tom mm -hmm. Tugendhat. Ian Duncan Smith has been banging on about this now for years, possibly over a decade. And Tom Tugendhat, who is a minister between the MOD and the FCO, which also does security, has gone as far as he can possibly stretch his ministerial portfolio to call out some of the things that are happening both in China in terms of uh, their human rights abuse, but also the way China operates uh, abroad and has been so hawkish on this in comparison with a lot of people in my own party and, and other parties. And I think... I think the China issue is one of those ones where it is so complicated and it's not really something that you can see, feel, hear or touch that a lot of people just get on with other bits of politics and they don't worry about it and they think that somebody else is going to be in charge of that. MI5 or MI6 or GCHQ or somebody's going to do it and it's just going to get done. And, and actually, 
maybe we've all dropped the ball a bit on this. So just to recap on this, um, the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowdham placed sanctions on two people in a company linked to the Chinese state following cyber attacks, both on our election watchdog, that's the Electoral Commission, which happened back in 2021. And they also called out China-backed operators for targeting parliamentarians, including Ruth, as you were saying, IDS and Duncan Smith, right? And then he's also said he's con- considering changing the threat level, uh, which would change how the government views China. But Ian Duncan Smith said that the response to the threat was like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. Stuart MacDonald of the SNP Uh, said that it was like taking a wooden spoon to a gunfight. And a former cabinet minister, as uh, the deputy prime minister was in the chamber, outlining uh, their response to these cyber attacks that they had pinned on the Chinese state in some way or another, texted me saying, two individuals sanctioned in a country of 1.4% billion exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark i.e. not very impressed so in a way dowden might be moving ruth to where the mood of not just the tory party but other parliamentarians are but again it's a sort of moment where the government kind of rhetoric doesn't really match the action yeah i I kind of agree and i also think the way he kind of gave it a big build up at the dispatch box made it sound as if there was going to be bit more beef. And I think as well, because there was sort of coordination with the US, they also came out on the same day and kind of sanctioned some hackers that were a hacker group that in some way is affiliated to the Chinese government, but isn't part of the Chinese government as far as I can work it out. Uh, I think, again, meant that it should be teeth. But but I guess there is also this idea, people would hope that the bit that you're allowed to say out loud is only a fraction of the whole and that there is perhaps greater funding that's being put to um, a particular element of GCHQ that's in charge of both monitoring and defending cyberspace for us, and that there is perhaps a lot more work going on that, that you can't actually tell the world about. I really hope so. You know that more members of parliament have been sanctioned by China. So Nusrat Ghani was sanctioned by China. Ian Duncan Smith, Helena Kennedy has been sanctioned because they have spoken up so forcefully about the human rights issues around the Uyghur Muslims in northern China. So we have a situation where there has been a cyber incidents, one to the Electoral Commission and then another where they tried to get into members of parliament's uh, inboxes and, and, and apparently didn't manage it. It does feel a little bit like a wooden spoon taken to a knife fight. I mean, I also think, Ruth, I don't know what you think about this in terms of how far they went. You know, we also had James Cleverly, then Foreign Secretary. He was in Beijing trying to boost investment into the UK from China. That was last year in 2023. Over the weekend, EVE Energy, a Chinese manufacturer of electrical vehicle batteries, announced it's in talks to invest more than a billion to build a giant new factory on the outskirts of Coventry, bringing 6,000 jobs to the area. I guess what I'm getting at, Ruth, you know what I'm getting at, which is there's these inherent tensions between perhaps foreign policy security concerns and commercial interests. Well, and also economic growth because it is a big investment whether that's private companies that happen to have a background in China whether that's the Chinese state you know we are desperate to get economic growth in this country to bounce back after Covid and Ukraine and all the rest of it and raise the standard of living and all of these other things that we talk about that's not unrelated to what our economic output as a country is uh, and how we're able to fund all of the other things that all of these things are interconnected but I, I take your point and I think one of the things that was less commented on this week was a committee appearance in the House of Commons by the umbrella organisation for motor manufacturers who were saying that that actually there are components in electric cars uh, and there are electric cars made by Chinese companies wherein they can be controlled by China. You know, you could cause uh, some form of, I mean, he was not saying, to be fair, he was not saying that it was likely or that there was any threat of it at the moment, but that theoretically you could have the M25 like fall to a standstill or you could stop all vehicles that had these component parts. So I think that we just have to be on this in a way that we haven't been. We've maybe been a bit bit dozy about this up until now. I think it falls to Ruth's uh, constant uh, on this podcast that she talks about the problem of the the 14 years of conservatism not having a single line that goes through it that can tell a story is that the 
UK's policy towards China has chopped and changed from the point where at one point with Cameron we were literally getting married to Xi Jinping and then Liz Truss was attempting a knife fight with him and and then Rishi Sunak sort of I actually don't know where he stands on the issue somewhere in between and I think that that is a problem and China actually is a different beast from the last time that the Labour government were in power it is an entirely different era of China politics and actually what good governance I think in this instance would look like is a very very clear and defined policy around both security and also investment that just at least is stuck to for more than five minutes and we would end up in a slightly better place but the trouble is with the cost of living crisis at the moment we are directly beholden to either oil despots or Russian gas. And I I fear that we're not learning the lessons of reliance on, you know, Russia obviously is a pariah state to us now. Iran is a pariah state and China isn't. And we haven't defined where we want to sit with it. And I think that's been the problem. You know, that I remember the golden era when Cameron and Osborne were talking about kind of strengthening economic ties. Like we've moved gradually away from that position through Theresa May and to Boris Johnson when he took action on Huawei having roles in our critical infrastructure and allowing Chinese back firms uh, to invest in our, our nuclear infrastructure. Right. So going back to your point, Ruth, about cars but there has been a lot of chopping and changing on policy now you could say when the facts change I change my mind I mean maybe that is what the Conservative Party and the Conservative government has been doing just to let you know that the PM has actually been at the liaison committee the liaison committee for you all out there is when the heads of different select committees so these are backbench committees where MPs quiz politicians cabinet ministers basically on policy areas the heads of all those committees go into the super committee and then they ask the prime minister questions it's called the liaison committee i don't know why we can't get better descriptions for justice what these league are. i call it we call it the justice league committee because it's like all the superheroes in one room getting to take on sorry the let's, baddie. <laughs> sorry who's your so who's your liaison committee superhero oh there's been a couple i mean diana johnson was uh yeah. Who's the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee was my one of my superheroes She's today. She's quite effective. But I would say um, Kat McKinnell, who is on a sort of committee who people sort of forget about the petitions committee. But Kat McKinnell sort of famously skewered Rishi Sunak over his wife's interests in childcare firms uh-huh, I um, that. at that um, but the best liaison committee ever was on the day that everybody was resigning while Boris Johnson was in the liaison that committee. Was- <laughs> that one was out of this world. He went to the liaison committee uh, as a coup. I mean, literally the letters of everyone resigning <laughs> from his government kept coming in and he just put... I got You've got to admire him for the shuts power of that, if anything. He just kept, went in there and did it. I love the liaison committee. It's literally my favourite. Well, it's so powerful because yeah. we've got them in Hollywood and other ones have it as well. And there's a way of holding people to account because you, the, the Premier, the First Minister, or Prime Minister, whoever it is, doesn't always have to come to committees to be questioned on a particular issue. But if they choose to go, they know what the issue is. So they can get they can gen up on the issue. You go to a liaison committee or you go to the, the heads of all the committees committee, whatever it's called in any of the administrations, you have literally zero idea who's going to ask you what. You can be asked anything about anything. It's the toughest gig you can possibly do in politics. Yeah, what they do is they go, I'm going to talk about foreign policy and that could be anything it must be like prepping for exam Rishi Sunak's quite good at it though because he's kind of like he's probably good at swatting up and then they go in with these huge folders and anyway I need to tell you what the prime minister said at the liaison committee about China he said I am entirely confident that our approach to dealing with the risk that China poses is very much in line with our allies and in most cases go further in protecting ourselves. He added, China represents the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. Ruth, what do you think about the way in which the government has moved? And also, I would say that the base threat to our economic security a lot of the MPs. I think are, he's picking his words because exactly because a lot of the M- because yeah. that's not about the infrastructure yes. security. That's not about um, data yes. security. That's not about yeah. um, 
defence security. And actually, you could ask question marks about all of these. But but I agree with both of you. I think that it has been certainly had a progression in terms of the change in which the government has dealt with China. I think if you sort of go all the way back to the Cameron and Osborne days, they were probably chatting to all of their pals, all of these G20s and Davoses and all the rest of it, and just seeing China throw money at other countries through their Belt and Road policy mm. and thinking, well, we want a bit of that. We want, you know, for us to be doing our job, we want to see investment in our own country and not be the country that gets left out. I kind of see that. You can kind of understand that. But in terms of when did we decide that China was a threat, I think we probably should have decided that a long mm, time ago. Uh, I think in terms of the fact that you don't get nothing for nothing in this world is a pretty basic lesson. And the reason that China was investing in huge swathes of infrastructure across Africa and across Asia and across Europe was because they wanted either access or they wanted return or they wanted something else. And in our case, it was probably because they wanted something else. So I think we used to maybe think that they didn't know what they wanted all the data for. I think we're now finding out what they want the data well, for. What do you what do you think the something else is, Ruth? Control? Yeah, I think it's... it's it, control's a really loaded word, but, but I think it, it is. It's about where the next level of espionage takes you. And I think this is a form of espionage. So it's about knowledge. It's about power. It's about control. When you go to China on a parliamentary trip, you are briefed by the FCDO. So that's the Foreign Office. Office. Sorry, the Foreign Office. Essentially, you are told that they will try and get compromising information about you. So... I mean, I'm, I'm not joking like honey traps, like being sent. And You're also told to take a burner phone. Yeah, you, you? I, well, I wasn't. I left my phone at Heathrow. Yeah, you when have I to leave your Beijing. phone. Yeah. yeah. But they are trying to find compromising things specifically on those who have critiqued them. And it's not even as if they're necessarily going to use it. That's the thing about China is that where I say, like, we wouldn't be allowing Iran or Russia to set up a battery company in Coventry at the moment. Now, I, you know, nobody's going to sit and say that China's going to mount a war on us. You know, they're not like a risk to us in, in that way. And so it's quite easy for the British public to ignore it. But it, it's a long game. Like they want to be powerful. They've got powerful and they want to retain their power. And they are shoring up ways of retaining their power in the future. And I don't think it's expansionist beyond the places that they consider, say, your Hong Kong, your your, your Taiwan. It's not expansionist beyond the borders that you might imagine. But it's, it's just this sort of silent, quiet threat. And it is a massive, massive threat to our economy in the future. It's coercive control. It is coercive control rather than a beating. Yeah. Yeah, that's what, you know, that's definitely the way I'd describe it. Let's pause there. Coming up, your messages and questions. And we wanted to come back to the government's Rwanda plan on this episode because we had an email from Karen who says, the whole thing feels a bit a shameful mess. And Karen asked if we could clarify a bit more what the actual policy is. Is and this is actually partly my bad uh, because in the la in the when the episode we were talking about it, I didn't help because as someone pointed out, this was Josie that pointed this out actually. Another person writing in, thank you, Josie, that it's not failed asylum seekers who will go there. It's actually they're processing claims. So if we just go back to what the policy was, I'm right in thinking what happened was the government made it illegal. Uh, to come to the UK and claim asylum if you come via a small boat, right? It's not just small boats, it's any irregular crossing. Right. So if you were to like hang on the bottom of a lorry as well, or if you were even arrive on a plane, if you haven't come through one of the safe and legal yeah. routes of which from most countries there isn't one. So if you're from Ukraine, it won't happen to you because there is a safe and legal route for you to come from Ukraine. There's a very, very narrow... A grouping of people who can potentially come from Afghanistan and then there are people who come on work visas, student visas, etc. Those are the legal routes to come and settle in our country. If you come without any of those systems, you are considered to be an illegal, government's words, not mine, it, what it actually means is that you came irregularly to yeah. the UK. And it can be anyone, even if your claim hasn't been processed, even though the vast majority of people's claims for asylum are found to be 
completely legitimate. So, so under the government's plan, some asylum seekers arriving in the UK in a regular by regular means yeah. would be sent to Rwanda to have their claims processed there yeah. and if successful they could be granted refugee status and allowed to stay in Rwanda and if not they could apply to settle in Rwanda on other grounds. That's absolutely right. So you could easily have, you know, a soldier who fought with the British Army from Afghanistan who got on a boat and there are plenty of them doing that ending up in Rwanda. So where are we? I mean, the first flight was scheduled to go in June 2022, was cancelled after legal challenges. In November 2023, the UK Supreme Court declared the policy unlawful because Rwanda was not a safe country. And that brings us up to the moment now, because the Rwanda bill is all about putting into law that Rwanda is a safe country to make it essentially lawful to send people that arrive in this country by irregular means over to Rwanda to have their claims processed. One wonders why the government doesn't just legislate that China won't hack us. It's not clear whether even if the government does legislate and the legislation passes, which we expect to happen after uh, the Easter break, uh, whether there won't be uh, Claims in the courts, whether the policy will get off the ground. And now there's obviously talk about what plane they're going to use because commercial airlines don't want to be anywhere near it for obvious reasons. It's politically quite a hot potato. Well, it's, it also comes back to even if they do get off a, a plane off the ground, to what end and purpose? If you've got thousands of people claiming asylum or coming through non-legal routes or contravening what the UK has said is, you know, you should claim asylum in the first safe country you come to, even though the UN Refugee Council says that's not a rule, that's just the UK's rule. To what purpose is sending 200 people to Rwanda when you've got claims backed up around the block that are thousands strong? Another, actually a conservative figure actually also messaged me about this saying, you know, this this talk about the government offering thousands of migrants £3,000 to voluntary be the people that go to Rwanda they made the point of uh, instead of detaining and removing those on small boats they are going to use very limited capacity in Rwanda for these volunteers as it costs two million per migrant this is the most expensive resettlement scheme in the world and that was from uh, someone that sits on Rishi Sunak's benches obviously not very happy with the scheme, probably for the opposite reasons to you, Ruth, because they want it to work and they don't think it will, whereas you don't like the scheme. But nevertheless, it speaks to the splits. I don't like the principle. No. I, I, I think that you should shoulder your burden in the world and you should make a decision here about who gets to stay and who gets to go. And the rules should be transparent and they should be open and they should be honest and people should be able to have an answer quickly and they shouldn't be stuck in limbo for years at a time. And I'm sure what the government would say if I was imagining a conversation with number 10 sources is we promise to stop the boats and this is one scheme that will help do that we're driving down boat crosses this is what they would say uh, you know and they would say this is one strand of of that whole wider policy i think we are going to be talking about this a lot after easter don't you Right, we've got to go. Ruth, Jess, it's Easter. What are you doing this Easter weekend? Jess? So far, the only plan I've got is that I'm going to go to Costco on one of the days. Nice. So. Never been. I'd love to go. Oh, I'll, I'll take you. You get your steps in and you basically, although COVID ruined the free samples a bit, but I think they're back now, you basically get a free <laughs> dinner and just walk around. Oh, it's like going to Ikea for the Swedish meatballs. Ruth? What are you doing? Uh, thoroughly ignoring the advice of uh, Dr. Andrew Kelso, who is the medical director uh, at Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care Board, who has decided to say, please don't eat an Easter egg in one go. What? Uh, what? Says, said medical director. Uh, and other advice to help you and your family keep well over the holidays. I am sorry, I don't care the size of the egg, but one Easter egg is one portion. A hundred percent. As someone from the home of Cadbury's, I say that while well, I've got no medical training, it's absolutely fine to eat an Easter egg in one go. Well, I'm going to have to take us off potting because we've run out of time. So thank you for listening. Remember that you can WhatsApp voice note us on my burner phone 07934 200 444 or send an email to electoral dysfunction at sky.uk. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Happy Easter. Bye.